we're going to transition now to talking about applications of aqueous equilibria, which basically means we're going to apply our understanding of equilibrium and acid-base chemistry from previous chapters to more complex systems with practical applications. And the first thing we're going to look at is the common ion effect. What we call a common ion is just an ion that's present in a solution from two different species. So we could say it's present both in a salt added to a solution and in the solution itself. To give just a few examples of this, if we have a solution that contains both NaCl and KCl, this is a common ion situation in which the chloride anion is common to both salts. More commonly, we're looking at a sparingly soluble salt in conjunction with a very soluble salt. So that might be something like sodium sulfate, Na2SO4, together with barium sulfate, in which the sulfate anion is common to both salts. It's also important to recognize that this applies to both weak and strong acids as well, since we can think of an acid as H plus with a counter anion. So for example, acetic acid, CH3CO2H, and sodium acetate, CH3CO2Na, have the acetate anion in common. Even though acetic acid is a weak acid and we don't consider it dissociating completely, as we're about to see, acetate present from sodium acetate has an impact on the acid dissociation equilibrium of acetic acid. And this is essentially the common ion effect. It's the impact of this dissolved common ion on an equilibrium associated with one of the two species in solution. So, for example, in the first two cases where we're looking at ionic salts, it's really a question of solubility, the way the common ion impacts the solubility of the sparingly soluble salt, for example. In the bottom case, it's about acid dissociation and pH, and the way in which the added ion impacts the acidity and the pH of the solution formed from the acid. To look at a concrete example of this, the pH of a solution that is 0.1 mole per liter in acetic acid is 2.98. However, if instead of using pure water to prepare the solution of acetic acid, we used water that already had some sodium acetate dissolved in it, such that the concentrations of both the acid and sodium acetate are 0.1 mole per liter, the pH of the resulting solution would be 4.74. Now, in both of these cases, the pH is less than 7, and we've seen previously that this comes about because of the forward acid dissociation reaction of the acid with liquid H2O. This is a reversible reaction because acetic acid is weak, but if we start with acetic acid and no acetate present, then this is going to go in the forward direction to generate H3O+, and this is the origin of the pH less than 7 in both of these solutions. However, we see that this solution that contains some sodium acetate appears to be less acidic and have a smaller equilibrium concentration of hydronium than the one that started with no acetate. And we can understand why this is the case actually using tools we've seen before, specifically by using an ice table to calculate the equilibrium pH in both cases. So in the first case, let me color code this a little bit, and let's look at the first case here in red. This is 0.1 molar acetic acid only, which comes out to a pH of 2.98. Initially, we're starting with no acetate in this case. That means that Q is equal to zero, and so on the change line, we can expect a significant forward reaction to give us a pH considerably less than seven. In the second case, let's draw that in blue, we actually start with some acetate in solution. And you want to think about this 0.1 mole per liter sodium acetate as already completely dissolved. And this is actually important to think about. Consider what sodium acetate is going to do when it's dissolved in water. This is a very soluble salt, so it's going to dissolve completely. That is, there will be no back reaction. The nice thing about this is we don't have to worry about equilibrium at all. We can take that 0.1 mole per liter of sodium acetate split up the sodium acetate into its component ions and treat all of that that was added as aqueous acetate. This is what allows us to go from the 0.1 mole per liter of sodium acetate given in the, in the problem statement, you might say, to the 0.1 mole per liter of acetate that we can write 
on the initial line. And there's an important general principle of equilibrium problems here, which is that you should do irreversible or complete reactions first. That is, you should clean up these reactions and sort of push them to completion before ever worrying about equilibrium. Dissociate any strong electrolytes completely before worrying about equilibrium processes. So when we do that here, we see that initially before we've turned on equilibrium, we've got 0.1 mole per liter of acetate present. If we think about this from the perspective of the reaction quotient, this is going to increase the reaction quotient in the blue case over what it is in the red case, which is of course zero since there's no acetate present initially. There is a tiny amount of hydronium present, so this is going to have an impact on the extent to which the reaction goes forward. In Le Chatelier's principal sense, we've added a product, and so the reaction will not quite go forward as much as it would in the absence of that product. This explains why the concentration of hydronium in the pure acid case is larger than the concentration of hydronium in the case when we have some acetate dissolved. And an important take-home message here is that this is basically a matter of Q versus K and Le Chatelier's principle. There's nothing really new in calculating these pHs. We can calculate them using an ice table just like we did in the previous chapter on equilibrium. What's new is the recognition that in this solution that contains sodium acetate, we have an ion present initially that is relevant to the acid dissociation equilibrium. We'll also notice this for solubility equilibria a little later in this chapter. Anytime a solution contains multiple components, that are introducing the same ion into the solution, they're going to influence one another's equilibria. And in cases we'll look at, one reaction will be completely irreversible and will go only in one direction. That is, we won't have to worry about equilibrium at all in that case. And the other will be more subtle and more reversible, and that's where we're going to introduce this non-zero initial concentration of either a reactant or a product and observe what's going on in the equilibrium.